Hello, my name is Mark Reid. I'm a professor of rural entrepreneurship and a director of a research centre at Scotland's Rural College. And I am uh, recording this from uh, a sunny Scotland. It does happen every now and then. Uh, I'm really sorry that I can't join you all in person. Uh, it sounds like a fantastic network. Um, I, I'm a social scientist, but I work on uh, agroecological issues quite broadly. So uh, the issues that you're looking at uh, here today very much close to my own heart. But I also do research on impact, and it's with that in mind that I am looking forward to talking to you about how you can evidence your impact. So I've done some research. I did some dissemination, some engagement, and I think that just maybe I have achieved some kind of benefit. And that's going to be my definition of impact. Impact simply as benefiting others outside the academy, whether that's uh, future generations, non-human species, uh, or something a bit more obvious. Uh, but I think there's a benefit from my research. Uh, but is there really? Uh, and if so, can I attribute that to me, to my research, uh, in any kind of credible way or not? Uh, and increasingly, funders uh, want evidence for, uh, for impact. Uh, you are going to be asked this. Uh, and given the challenge uh, of the time lags, you know, ideological issues, things way beyond your control that mean that despite your best efforts, you don't have impact. This is something we really need to think about in some depth. So I'm going to go through uh, some of the work that I've been doing on this. Uh, I'll highlight work from one of my most recent papers and my book, The Research Impact Handbook. And then I'm going to hand over to Dr. Rachel Blanche, who's been doing some cutting edge research uh, on some of the more creative methods that we can bring to this. Uh, my goal, uh, both me and uh, Rachel's goal here, is to, uh, oh, that's a cat that has decided to, uh, yes, thank you, Bobby, uh, to scratch its claws on the, uh, on the, the <laughs> on the bird table, which I've got you resting on here today. Uh, you can never predict animals and cameras, never a good mix. Um, so yeah, the goal uh, is uh, beyond just informing you. I want to inspire you, and so does Rachel. We want to inspire you to see evaluation, to see evidencing your research as something that you actually want to do, something that actually might get the creative juices flowing, that might actually enhance and add to your own research. So let's start by having a think about some of the basics. So I'm back inside my office uh, where I am safe from uh, my cat and uh, uh, hopefully a little bit more. <clears throat> Great, so that's me back in my office now and uh, safe from my interference from my cat. Uh, so uh, we're going to zoom in now and have a think about how we evaluate impact. Uh, I'm also going to think about how we might monitor impact on an ongoing basis um, and get some data that we can use for formative feedback to do better impact, but also to feed into our evaluation. And I'll think briefly about how we can turn all of that evaluation data into evidence that will speak to an audience and convince them that, yes, indeed, you did have impact. That was you, at least to some extent. Now, I'm going to give you a, a bunch of links that you can have a look at um, alongside this or after this uh, today. Um, and one is to a paper on impact evaluation that uh, Rachel and I co-authored. And in that, you'll see a version of this definition, which is that impact evaluation is about assessing both the significance and the reach of both positive and negative effects of research. And there's an important normative point here, which is that uh, despite the fact that our funders might want us to tell us only about the things which went well, it is our responsibility to look at both the positive and the negative things so that we can do better, uh, apologize, make up for, um, uh, counteract some of those negative effects when we spot them going on. But the task is, I'm going to suggest, incredibly simple. <laughs> the reality, of course, is, uh, is more challenging. But uh, conceptually, at least, we are simply creating causal chains or cause and effect relationships where the causes are research and the effect is the impact. But the point is that we create these causal chains that link our research to at least part of that effect. And of course, in that chain, there may be many steps, uh, which will typically be our engagement or pathway. It could be a patent, uh, a whole lot of things in between. 
Uh, but ultimately, that is our task. And at the end of the day, we aren't typically looking for sole direct attribution. It happens, but it's rare. Uh, instead, we are trying to build an evidence-based argument that uh, even if our research uh, was not the only thing that was going on here, our research made a significant contribution to that ultimate effect. Uh, it shaped it significantly. Uh, it wouldn't have worked as effectively without our research. It wouldn't have been so widespread. Um, it wouldn't have been enforceable. Uh, it would have been too expensive or whatever it was. So there needs to be some kind of argument that explains why our research played a significant role in actually delivering that benefit at the end of the day. Uh, and this is what we're best at. We are we're researchers after all. This is what we do. We create evidence and we turn that evidence into evidence-based arguments. So we're in our comfort zone here, I would suggest. Now, here is my typology from the Research Impact Handbook, and I'm going to give you um, a link to this uh, as a PDF so you all have this. And you can see from the left to the right, we've got early stage impacts through to late stage impacts. And let's remember, if we define impact simply as a benefit, all of these meet my definition. And in fact, in the paper that I've just alluded to that Rachel and I co-authored, uh, we have the first uh, peer-reviewed cross-disciplinary definition of impact uh, that makes this really clear. And the key thing that you need to understand is the difference between impact and engagement, uh, because there's a lot of confusion here. And on the left-hand side, uh, you, might, um, uh, you might be excused for being confused, because, yeah, understanding and awareness, capacity building, is this impact yet? I need to know what someone's going to do with that. Uh, but with the right framing, you can very easily argue, I'm going to suggest, uh, that um, the fact that uh, some policymakers are aware that there could be terrible negative unintended consequences from their policy, so they put that work on hold, that's, that's beneficial. Even if they haven't yet worked out what the solution is and got that back on track. Uh, the fact that we all now understand um, in the public that marine plastic pollution is a problem, and we didn't, uh, you can argue, it was important that we didn't understand that. And the fact that we do now is, is a benefit, it's a public good. Even although, of course, we want to know what people are going to do about that and we want to see that change in attitudes and behaviour in decisions and policies ultimately leading to a reduction in marine plastic pollution. The same goes for capacity or preparedness. Um, uh, the fact that we have new skills, new capabilities, we can do things we couldn't do before. Um, you know, the fact that we're prepared for that disaster, that's a benefit. Although, of course, until disaster strikes, until I can actually use that skill in practice, uh, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen next. Uh, but the point is that I can now not just to disseminate, put out a policy brief, do some media engagement. I actually try and understand. Uh, are people now understanding? Are people aware of things they weren't aware of before? Uh, do they have capacities they didn't have before? And I'm collecting that evidence now uh, of the change in understanding, uh, the actual skills people have uh, as a result uh, of this. Um, the, the, how, how much stronger the, the storm wall is, uh, or higher it might be, or how much more protected that community is against uh, a, a potential future risk or, or disaster. Uh, and I've got a sense of that, the significance of that, uh, and potentially the reach of that as well. And when it comes to understanding and awareness, um, there are huge challenges here. Uh, I'll give you a link to my media impact toolkit, um, uh, which gives you much more on how to do this. Uh, social media, uh, your press office will give you metrics of reach. You need to go beyond that because for all I know, uh, thousands, millions of people have been reached and I offended them all uh, or nobody understood a word I said. We need to go deeper uh, than just reach. So uh, hopefully I've communicated this idea of impact as benefit, this idea that it's different to just engagement. And that's important. I need to disseminate, engage. Uh, a patent is an important stepping stone, but until that has actually been commercialized, there's no economic benefit. Until people are using it, it's not helping anyone's health or reducing greenhouse gas emissions or whatever. Uh, so we're, we're, we're distinguishing this and we are looking for the benefit in our evaluation. Uh, and I will start by looking at that left hand side and see, well, did that start off with uh, an understanding and awareness thing? Did that change attitudes? Was there changes in behavior? What was the policy? Uh, maybe it was uh, guidelines or strategy, not national policy. Maybe it was local policy. 
Uh, was that policy actually implemented? Was it enforced? Did it work? And out ultimately deliver those uh, things at the end of the day. Uh, and uh, the evidence is sadly quite clear. There are three studies now that have looked at this um, and uh, they all concluded that uh, the most impressive impacts uh, typically take decades uh, to achieve. Uh, and so an important um, side point here is that uh, by focusing on the early stuff, which I can point out at this point, anyone can do, no matter where you are in the research process, uh, as long as you are basing this on someone's evidence, even if that's not yours, uh, build your capacity, uh, build trust, um, uh, get skills, get experience, uh, do that stuff at the beginning based on uh, existing literature, on bodies of work. Um, uh, and uh, and you're now giving something back to your community. So it's not just this extractive thing where uh, you uh, invite people along to your workshops, they help it feed into your research, but yeah, they might be retired by the time uh, they, uh, they ultimately get the benefit. So we can give that uh, early impact uh, back to them. We build awareness, we build understanding, we build capacity, we change behaviors, we, we help people with organizational policies, for example, uh, and we help them uh, on the journey towards implementing them in their context. And eventually, yeah, we get these things. So great, we're looking for these causal chains between impacts uh, and from these impacts through our pathway and engagement all the way back to our research, hopefully, uh, or uh, it may be to other people's research in early days as we're building our impact skills. But the point is we can trace these causal chains. One thing leads to the next, leads to the next. And uh, uh, and we're looking to avoid gaps. Uh, so uh, if I'm making some leap of logic here, uh, assuming, um, so Brian Cox, uh, for example, does lots of TV shows on um, uh, on, on physics in the UK. And, uh, and I'm assuming now that, um, uh, that uh, because loads of people have watched my TEB programs and we can see an increase in the number of people going to study physics, that that must be me. Uh, well, there's a, probably a few steps in between that you might want to prove to check that it really was you that did that. And you're trying to make sure that that is as transparent as possible. Now, when it comes to uh, the methods for doing this, um, there are some very simple things that we can all do that just yeah, speaks to anyone as a researcher. Well, what is the variable that I need to measure? Uh, and if these are the, the variables or the outcomes, then what are the methods I would use to collect data like that? And it's pretty common sense type stuff. So this is my fast track impact planning template. I'll give you a link to this as well. Uh, and when I'm planning a project, I have my impact goal. Uh, and when I'm creating that impact goal with my stakeholders, I co-produce these typically, I'm asking them, well, what would success look like? And that often is a great way of actually clarifying my goals. How would I know that we've reached that point? Well, let's look at some uh, some means of measuring this, uh, this success point that you've told me about. Uh, and I'll also look for um, uh, indicators of successful engagement that can give me that formative feedback along the way in case things are not going according to plan so I can spot that early. Uh, and now this could be something qualitative. Well, people would say something like this. It could be uh, something that is being collected in national statistics, which I can analyze, uh, or something that I'm going to collect myself. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. But you can, of course, go much deeper than this. And I would suggest that we need to. And one of the reasons for this is that uh, when I come up with a plan for a project, uh, this is what I think will happen. And of course, reality is sometimes not quite so linear and predictable. I need to be able to look for other things other than just the things that I'm looking for from the outset. And so uh, this is the uh, framework that you can see in the paper that uh, Rachel and I developed um, uh, with our co-authors which uh, at the top of the screen here uh, suggests that uh, I do some research, which um, has my, an impact plan that I've just gone through with you. We go through our pathway, we try and achieve some impacts, and yeah, I think we've got impact, but I'm not sure I need to do an evaluation, and that's what's in this grey box. So uh, uh, at the heart of this is an evaluation design, uh, and what design I choose will be dictated by the aims of my evaluation and my context. Things like how much time and resources do I have? Let's be realistic here. Uh, and when you look at the evaluation design, you suddenly realize as a researcher that you're kind of familiar with this. This is essentially a research design. So uh, what I'm suggesting here is we put our researcher hat on uh, go back to everything that we already know 
and uh, ask ourselves the research question, what is our impact? And ask ourselves then, what is the relevant research design uh, if we want to demonstrate, prove that we've had an impact like that? <clears throat> I'll come on to this in a bit more depth. So uh, we choose the relevant methods for that research design. We collect that data. Alongside that, we've been collecting monitoring data. I'll um, come on to that in a moment. And, uh, and that's giving us formative feedback, as you can see from this um, feedback arrow here. Uh, and ultimately put that together and you've got the evidence you need that it was significant, uh, there was reach, and at least some of this can be attributed to us. Great job done. Now, uh, in the links that I'll send you, I will also send you this decision tree linked to the paper, which we didn't publish in the paper itself, to try and help you decide which of these research designs or evaluation designs is most relevant to you for your purpose. And uh, as you can see, you can scroll through this in your own time, uh, but just uh, even on the screen here, hopefully you're already seeing, huh, there are some things here that I've used before or that my colleagues use. Uh, and the, 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 the dots I want you to join in your minds uh, are that, huh, actually, I can use my own methods to evaluate impact. Interesting. <laughs> and at this point, I realise that there could be some nice win-wins back to my research. <clears throat> so uh, by putting my researcher hat on uh, and, uh, and using whatever research methods I might have in my own disciplinary toolkit, I might well be able to uh, add some additional depth uh, and maybe even some additional rigor to my research. So I'm doing an, an applied research project here. Uh, many of us here today applied ecologists. Uh, well, you know what, if it doesn't actually work in policy, in practice, in the real world, how good is my research really? And to get into that top journal, in fact, having that demonstration of impact actually in the real world can be the difference between getting into that uh, that, uh, that high tier journal. Uh, so maybe it's a part of your next paper. It could even be a paper in its own right. I've done a, a few along those lines myself. Uh, it could be an epilogue to your book, um, something along those lines. Uh, great, win-win. Uh, and, uh, and now all of a sudden, I'm excited. I'm going to deploy a bit of postdoc time to this. Uh, maybe it's a bit of unfunded research on the side, uh, but I'm curious. And I think for most of us, uh, we don't really feel that curious or excited about evaluating our impact. But asking and answering a question, how actually does this work in policy and practice? Uh, and, uh, and getting curious about that is something that I think most of us can get quite excited about. Now, of course, there's always the chance that uh, I, I go through this process and I realize, yeah, the kind of stuff I do, there's nothing that I can use. Uh, so now I go, go and I look for targeted help. But the point is I've done that research design kind of thinking in my own head and I remain in the driving seat. <clears throat> So let's be proportionate here uh, because there is a challenge here. When I do that kind of gold standard design, very often I come up with a really nice project that would prove my impact, but it's gonna be hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, of, of research funding and uh, five years of my life to actually do it. And maybe it's worth going and putting in the application and trying to get that funding. Uh, but if not, and then ask yourself, okay, this is what I would ideally do, but can I now kind of pick off a few of these things? So let's do an online survey. Um, uh, let's look at some case studies, do a few interviews. Um, and what we're doing here uh, in most impact evaluations is that we are demonstrating rigor from this social science conception of triangulation. So I check things from different angles and they all point to the same direction. And this then demonstrates that it is probably uh, something which I can rely on. Uh, and so we're doing this, uh, we're putting this back to our community. So here's my evaluation. Do you believe it? Uh, a bit flaky, there's a few gaps here. Um, uh, yeah, what about this? What about that? Okay, let's plug those gaps. Um, and by the time I've done that now, we've gone from maybe hours to days of work, but we're certainly not looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars in five years of my life. Um, so this is achievable. Uh, but instead of starting with that, that back of the envelope approach, starting with my researcher head on, I'm likely to do a better evaluation and I'm likely to spot those win-wins back to my research where they exist. Uh, it should be pointed out that where you think that um, uh, yeah, uh, we're going to uh, suggest something works that could be applied um, in environmental policy, that if this goes wrong, we're going to waste millions of pounds, maybe even risk habitats, people, lives. <laughs> uh, yeah, we need to do some kind of randomized control trial type thing. We need the money to do the, the full evaluation. 
but for most of us, um, that's, that's overkill. So here are a few examples of the kinds of mixed methods designs that, that you might want to pull together uh, to get this data. And this first example pulls together a method called postcard to your future self. I'll put a link uh, to that um, into the email that you'll get. And uh, I can do this in public engagement. It can be on people's seat in a lecture. It can be at the back of an exhibition. In this case, this is uh, environmental policy. And the policymakers come to my seminar. They've got a postcard on their seat. At the end, I ask them to fill in the postcard. How could you put what you've learned today into policy or practice? Give them your address, tick a box to say you're, if you're happy or not, maybe follow up with you. And I post this back to you one month later. A month later, they get this postcard reminding them uh, from themselves, I wanted to do this. Have I done this yet? Maybe not. And you increase the likelihood that they actually go and do that thing that you get impact. And for those who tick the box, you can then contact them to say, so you said you were going to do this. How did that go? Can I help you with that? Uh, so we increase impact and we have the permission now to follow them up six months later, point two, with an online survey. Last point on that is, can I interview you for the interesting things that are going on here? Now let's go into it some more depth. Put this all together now and I've got some fairly convincing evidence that there's something interesting going on. The second example then... Uh, it goes to um, social media and there's, uh, or mass media, uh, TV, all of these kind of things. How do I prove that that has had impact? Uh, well, as I said at the beginning, we need to make sure that we aren't just looking at the reach metrics. We go deeper than this. So I'm going to do some qualitative analysis of what people are saying on social media. Uh, I might uh, pay a polling company. So a, a colleague that I interviewed in my podcast uh, a couple of years ago, got their, uh, their um, uh, evidence integrated into a TV soap called Casualty in the UK. Uh, four episodes all about maggot therapy. And, um, and she put out a survey before asking uh, Casualty viewers what their yuck factor was uh, in relation to maggot therapy uh, before and after the four episodes to look at a decrease in the yuck factor and an increase in the likelihood that they would accept maggot therapy uh, on our NHS. And then she worked with the larger supplier of maggots to the NHS to then look for an increase in sales. A fantastic job done. Of course, that costs lots of money. If you don't have that money, you can do this for free using a funnel approach, getting people in via social media and then persuading them to take those surveys, either on social media or something more sophisticated, maybe even inviting them to focus groups, things like that. So uh, time, but uh, yeah, not so expensive. My third and final example links to some of my own research, so here was one of my own challenges. Uh, we saw this announcement in the budget uh, for, the, from the, for the government in uh, 2020, and we were pretty sure this was us. Uh, we'd recommended this uh, from our research, but of course no, pol no citation in the policy document itself. So uh, if this is you, and this is a common thing, uh, I think I've had impact, the first step is to say, yeah, here's a statement, and look, this is how it marries up with, with our research. But I can't prove this, this is circumstantial. Second point then is to go to the pathway and have a look, what is the evidence that actually it was indeed us that was informing government of this? So we did a policy brief, we were invited to give evidence, that evidence was then cited in some report. Uh, okay, now put all of that together with that announcement and our research, and it's pretty obvious this was surely us, but you could still argue this is somewhat circumstantial. Uh, and so the final step is to then talk to someone who can actually say, yes, uh, indeed, uh, I can see that whole pathway, and that was to at least some extent you. And in the example you can see here, I was an advisor to a committee which wrote a report. Uh, that report was ultimately what was used to come up with the figure, which then went into the budget. Uh, but uh, all that I've got in that report is a thing at the beginning saying, saying that I advised them. Still no use. But uh, I know that I advised them on how to construct their model. So I went and spoke to the researchers and said, can you show me your model, please? And sure enough, uh, we hit gold when uh, they show us it's a spreadsheet model and highlighted in yellow is uh, that those are our papers that they've used uh, for the model. Uh, great, and so now I'm talking to uh, a policy maker who is saying, yes, I, 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 I know uh, that we were the people who put that into the budget and we used those figures from the Committee on Climate Change. 
Uh, and yes, uh, I've seen what you've shown me here, that in fact this was your research that was behind the model that powered the numbers that we then used. Fantastic, job done, uh, and, uh, and you can see that clear causal chain all the way through. Now, there is a method you can use uh, to do this uh, much more quickly and easily. It doesn't always work, but it's uh, fascinating. Give it a try. Altmetric.com. Uh, so uh, here's my example. Uh, find out how to do it on the website. Uh, you find a paper that you've written with a DOI on it. Hit the Altmetric button, and this little donut appears in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Click through to that. Click onto the Policy Documents tab. And, uh, and I can see now huh, I've been cited in lots of different policy documents. I can follow through and maybe I do some follow up and some interviews or whatever, but uh, instantly a potential impact. Uh, I say potential, you're going to have to find out uh, is this beneficial uh, or not? Uh, how influential is this? Is it just going to be mentioned in the kind of introductory blurb or is it more substantive? Uh, and altmetrics, generally speaking, uh, will tell you that people are talking about your research. You need to then find out what they're saying and what the benefits are. So don't let this um, kind of run away from you. So uh, here is an example of uh, me having written this up. And, uh, and so you can see here we have a bunch of quotes that are integrated into a narrative. And uh, I've done this with an interview. So uh, I started by getting ethics approval because I want to record this. Um, uh, I'm offering some help. It's not just it purely extractive. I'm asking if there was anything significant, if so, what the reach was, checking this was in fact something to do with me and my research, and checking if there's anything we could have done better so I can learn from what went wrong. Remember, this is about positive and negative. I transcribe this and then I'll draft my testimonial. You can see an example of one here that's been drafted. Uh, they can see what they said. I can see what uh, they can see what I've now drafted based on what they said, and they can either amend that um, uh, or say yes. I'm happy to say that. Put that onto letterhead of the paper. I'm making their job easy. Now, I said that I would briefly touch on impact monitoring or tracking. I don't want to spend long on this because um, uh, it's not exciting. But in fact, that's the problem. None of us are excited by this, and so we don't do this. And the problem you have is that someone at some point is going to ask you what your impact was, and you're going to suddenly realize, huh, not sure, I'm scratching my head, I'm looking through my email, uh, I'm scrolling through my calendar, and I can't remember. It takes you far longer, you do a less good job. And so my message is very simply, uh, do something, uh, anything, uh, but don't just leave this to chance. Uh, and, and essentially what you need is a dumping ground. Um, so I know people who just have an extended CV. Uh, uh, maybe you turn that into a Google Doc and it's a team of CV uh, and everyone can pile in uh, and you maybe check in every quarter or once a year uh, in a team meeting and give everyone time to update on anything they think might be impact. Uh, email stuff to yourself, uh, put in uh, the code word uh, hashtag impact into the title. Now search hashtag impact, everything comes up. Not the best idea in case you move institution, nobody else can see in, maybe your laptop fails and it wasn't saved, uh, backed up. Uh, I use Evernote uh, to do this, um, so you can see this screenshot here. Um, here's something, uh, a committee that I've uh, put some stuff into. I can email stuff into this. I can put stuff directly in from social media. Um, it's just a nice, uh, quick, easy way for me to, um, uh, to just dump stuff. Uh, and when I need to prove my impact, I can go through and check, is there anything interesting here that I can follow up on? So more on my website, um, uh, but uh, yeah, don't do necessarily what I do, just do something, that's my message. And whatever it is, do something that is quick and easy that you will actually do. Uh, don't worry about how fancy it is, just create some kind of dumping ground. Now, I'm going to conclude by talking a little bit more about how we turn our evaluation, our monitoring data into evidence that people might believe. Now, in the UK, we have a thing every seven years or so, the government assesses our impact. Uh, we get ranked, we get funding or not, as the case may be, depending on how good that is. And so uh, we've got quite good uh, at working out how to convince uh, panels of experts that uh, we did have an impact, honestly. Uh, and in fact, with one of my PhD students, Bella Reichard, we wrote a paper looking at high versus low scoring impact case studies to try and understand what is it that seems to resonate, that seems to, to work. 
And I'm going to go through this very quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, uh, and also, this is not for everyone. If you want to look into this in more depth, here's a paper. I'll give you a link to this. But three brief messages from this paper. And the first is simply that uh, you have to actually explicitly articulate what was significant, how far reaching was that, and make claims which are high in magnitude. So pretty obvious. Uh, this is what we're, we're trying to do. Uh, and as you can see on the screen here, uh, our quantitative linguistic analysis examples you know, with a policy theme that I've pulled out on the, on the screen here. Uh, in England, the UK, millions of the prime minister, for example, is definitely uh, higher in, uh, in magnitude uh, compared to the local or the north uh, city council uh, and the like. And these low, uh, low scoring ones are constantly emphasizing we have got impact, honestly, whereas the high scoring ones just explain what the impact is and it is self evident. But the number one predictor of low scores was this mistake I highlighted earlier that we are actually talking about the pathway, the dissemination, uh, key word under pathways to impact here, not the actual impact. So make sure you don't fall into that trap. Now, it's all very well articulating high magnitude art, uh, reach and significance, but if you can't demonstrate that that was in some way linked back to you and to your research, then you're still not going to convince your funders or anyone else that this was actually your impact. Uh, and so you can see on the left hand side of the screen here our quantitative linguistic analysis coming up with lots of different words for, uh, for attribution. And this is not style, I'll come on to that. Uh, these uh, have a function in the text. Uh, they are linking uh, research or pathway to impact. And there were uh, attributional words on the right hand side here in the low scoring case studies, but uh, in most of these cases, these are research uh, and pathway to other kinds of research and more pathways. And on the right hand side of those phrases, you're not seeing impact. So keep your eye on the goal here, which is we are trying to explain how our research led to impact. And so we have those causal chains uh, without the leaps in logic and such like. But uh, sadly and controversially, uh, the way that we communicate this does work, uh, does matter. Uh, so uh, plain language where we can uh, direct uh, clear, linear uh, and linearized versions of the messy complexity that is reality uh, using subheadings um, uh, and the like. Uh, we all like something clear and simple to read. Uh, and as long as you've got the evidence, uh, then how you actually communicate that does then make a difference. So this is not style over substance, it's style plus substance, uh, I would argue. Uh, and so uh, finally then, uh, we have a claim uh, which is gonna have a narrative structure, a causal structure, and a claim structure. So this is my own impact case study that I submitted to this uh, exercise. Um, and uh, here is, if I scroll through, um, I'll give you a link to this so you can see the, the full thing. Uh, the, uh, the narrative structure is simply we've got two impacts. We've got impacts on UK policy and we've got impacts on, oops, where did I go? There was a subheading somewhere. There we go, uh, on, the, on international peatlands policy. Uh, and uh, there are lots of different subclaims, but they've all been aggregated into two claims. Uh, each of those subclaims might not be particularly significant and far reaching in its own right, uh, which is why they've been aggregated. And now we have two claims that on aggregation are really impressive. That's the theory. And this was graded as uh, at the top score in the last um, exercise. So uh, it works. Uh, so now here is the uh, the anatomy of uh, the, uh, the the causal structure. Sorry, uh, so we've got a narrative structure, we've got two bro broad claims, and then we've got a causal structure uh, to what I'm claiming. Uh, so uh, we can see we've got research that led to the development of a policy mechanism, the Peatland Code, and we've got a quote from a policymaker saying, "Yep, Mark's research led to the uh, development of this code." Second point is that this research on the code then led to a significant contribution to the UK policy landscape, so a broad policy claim. And then finally, we've got that same narrative, uh, that same causal structure is picked up again um, at the culmination of the case study, which says, yep, remember, it's uh, my research on the Peatland Code, uh, which then leads to a series of, um, uh, contributes to a series of international resolutions, and those resolutions ultimately then lead to changes in policy in 29 countries. 
And then finally, uh, once we've uh, looked at that uh, overall narrative and causal structure, there is a structure to the, the claim itself. So this is the blue highlights here. Um, and so uh, we start by articulating what is the significance of your claim and the reach of the claim. And then we dive into the evidence. So uh, here is my claim to something which is significant and far reaching. So this is national policy with a jurisdiction of England. Um, and uh, let's look at the evidence then, and you can see yeah, with more specifics on the actual uh, hectorage. Um, we've got some context here to explain why that is significant. This is the first time we've had uh, such an ambitious target. Um, uh, and uh, and you can see as you work, you work through this text that uh, yeah this is uh, clearly and evidentially based um, it, the, there is something significant and far reaching at the scale of an entire country so I'm going to conclude at this point um, and uh, make sure you know how to get back in touch with me before I hand over to Rachel so uh, do please get in touch. Uh, I'll give you my contact details in the email that you'll all get. Uh, if you send your email to my PA, not me, then I guarantee a response within one week. Uh, but please do get in touch if you have any questions and enjoy all of the other resources and further reading. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Rachel now.